Hello there once again and welcome to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett along with Kat Myers. We're here every week meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And today we discuss a topic that everyone should know more about. Yes, it's about a, the very serious and somber topic of stroke. We've entitled this show Time is Brain because it deals with one of the major concepts that one has to consider when uh, facing a stroke or a possibility of a stroke. And we have an eminent expert, Dr. David Lee Gordon on the show uh, today to talk to us from the OU Medical Center, OU Medicine. Uh, and he's uh, been doing this for a number of years. He's recognized across the country as a genuine expert in this area. And he's going to give us some, our viewers some really good information that, uh, that we may not be quite familiar with yet, but I hope we will be after this show's over. It's coming up today on The Verdict. We'll be right back. why I moved to Rockaway is because it's such a diverse culture and different ethnicities and my camera has opened some doors to really meet people that I probably wouldn't have gotten to meet without it. I'm Beth Perkins, I'm a professional photographer and I'm Chickasaw. It came in as like a mini tidal wave. Everything sustainable was had just disappeared in one swoop and I just underestimated this power and I realized really how little we are in this whole scheme of things and how quickly things can go bad. My community is still rebuilding. And for them to just show up out of the blue and just start clearing out my house was, I don't, I'm not one that likes to ask for help. <laughs> so um, for someone to come and do that for me was, it was really touching and humbling. I've thought about the history of the Chicksaws and what they went through as far as relocating and losing their homes and having to rebuild and to thrive in the end after all of that is just a true testament to the Chicksaw strength. And I try and draw from that and remember that that's a part of who I am. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at ProfilesOfANation.com. People have been talking about energy independence for a long time. It's always been popular, but today it's possible. We have an enormous supply of oil and gas in the United States, much more than we thought just a few years ago. New technology, massive new discoveries, largely made by Oklahoma companies. It literally changes everything. And Oklahoma is leading the charge. Go watch this video to see why. Energy independence starts with us. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. As I indicated in the opening, uh, we are really pleased today to welcome Dr. David Gordon, David Lee Gordon, to the set to talk about time as brain. Dr. Gordon is uh, chair of the neurology department at OU Medicine. He did his undergraduate work at Duke University, did his uh, medical uh, uh, degree work at the University of Miami. Uh, he is board certified in, a, he's board certified in a number of areas, but uh, neurology, of course, being one of them. He's been listed uh, uh, in best doctors in America. He is the lead author of a course called Advanced Stroke Life Support. He's won the Masters, the Stanton L. Young Master Teacher Award in 2011 at OU Medicine. And he's recognized, as I indicated in the opening, as a, one of the leading experts in this area, and not simply the Southwest, but the nation as well. Uh, Dr. Gordon, welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, we're pleased you're here. Lost in that punch board of a, of a resume is, is uh, where you grew up specifically, how you got involved in medicine, and what, what drove you to this profession? So I was raised in Miami, Florida. I'm the seventh physician in my family, so it's kind of a <laughs> genetic defect, if you will. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm the only neurologist, so I had to be unique in some way. Yeah, way to go. Uh, so really, I've, it was, it's a natural family thing. We love teaching, and I knew about medicine and from a young age. That's mm -hmm. how I got into it. But neurology in particular, uh, to be a neurologist, you have to love to solve puzzles. It's very much uh, 
trying to figure out where the problem is in the brain and mm -hmm. putting pieces of the puzzle together a detective all the time and mm -hmm. I love that part of it uh, and later I got involved with stroke because it was a, such a fast growing field lots of new techniques and new treatments and uh, so after I medical school I did my residency in neurology in New York City at Mount Sinai then I did a stroke fellowship at the University of Iowa in Iowa City uh, where I met my wife a small town girl from Iowa uh, then I was on faculty in Mississippi for eight years directing a stroke program went to Miami for seven years back on faculty uh, and then I want to be the head coach somewhere that's how I got to Oklahoma I was looking for a head coaching job <laughs> uh, I wanted to be the chair of a department uh, and sometimes just like in sports if you want to be a head coach uh, in academic medicine teaching mm -hmm. medicine you may have to move so they already had a head coach in Miami they didn't have one in Oklahoma at the time and I came here in 2007 and I've been here ever since we've timed this show time is brain what does that indicate to you so we say time is brain because in the last 10 to 15 years, we've developed uh, new strategies for solving the pro problem of reversing a stroke if you act quickly. So let's start by saying what is a stroke? A stroke is a problem in the brain due to a blood vessel problem. Either a blood vessel gets plugged up or it bursts. Those are two kinds. Most, the vast majority, 85% are plugging. So there's a, a blood clot that forms somewhere in the heart or the arteries, floats downstream and plugs an artery to the brain. That's 85% of all strokes. And it turns out if you get there fast enough, if you use a Drano-like medicine called TPA to break open the clot, and you get there within three to four and a half hours uh, of the onset of the event, you can reverse a lot of the damage in the brain. So we, are, we actually stole this from the cardiologists because in the old, originally it was time is muscle for heart because if you treat a heart attack fast, you can reverse the heart attack. And once we started realizing that a blood clot breaker would wor also work for stroke, we started saying time is brain. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the kind of symptoms that a <coughs> one of our viewers might uh, uh, have that would tell them, oops, I better do something, uh, something's happening to me? Yeah, well, let me start by saying that, that most of the time when someone comes to the hospital with a stroke, it's because a witness is the one who called 911. I want, I want to make a very important point that, first of all, calling 911 is the most important thing. Uh, you know, many people think, oh, I'm, I'm not far from the hospital, I should go to the hospital with these symptoms or have my loved one go. No, because actually what you end up doing is getting stuck in a triage line in the front of the emergency department. You want to call 911, even if you're across the street from a hospital, and go right into the hospital to be treated. Now, what are the symptoms? Sudden, all the symptoms are sudden, because you're having a blood clot that suddenly blocks an artery. So the symptoms are sudden. Sudden onset of weakness on one side of the body. Sudden decreased sensation or numbness on one side of the body. Sudden inability to speak or understand speech. Sudden inability to see to one side in both eyes. Or a sudden dizziness that is unusual for you or a sudden headache that is unusual for you. Those are the typical. Now, everybody in the world gets headaches and migraines, but we're saying a different headache. It's, you've never had this kind before, more severe than usual. These are the kinds of things that can sometimes mean stroke. And if you have one of these things, or your loved one does, your first reaction should be call 911. And I want to make an interesting point about that. Uh, this is a true, true uh, fact, actually. Unfortunately, women get to the hospital slower than men for their strokes. Hmm. Hmm. Why do you think that is? It's because no the witness is the key. So the man, who's uh, a big denier, well. says, oh, you'll be OK. You know, we'll, we'll go to the doctor in the morning if you have any problems. Whereas the, the, the woman who gets nervous immediately and calls for her husband, calls 911 faster. So huh. the men can't be in such denial. The men have to also realize that when they have these symptoms or their loved one has these symptoms, call 911 fast mm -hmm. and get to the hospital. We can do something about it. At what age does, does the stroke start becoming more prevalent? Eight, well, three quarters of all strokes occur over age 55. So when you get in your late 50s, 60s is when the incidence will increase. However, stroke is not rare in young adults. People talk about stroke as an old person's disease because it's so much more common in the elderly. However, uh, it is actually twice as common as breast cancer in women under age 45 and twice as common even as multiple sclerosis in that population. And we think of those as more common diseases in, those in, in young women, but stroke is more common than those by far. It's a very common condition. Now, the things that cause stroke in young people are different from the ones that cause in old people, but still, blockage of arteries can occur at almost any age. What precautions should we take, and are they different precautions than, say, heart disease? Well, in terms of your daily activity prevention, you know, what should you do? It's very similar to heart very similar because the most common causes of stroke are related to bad pipes your arteries get damaged and they get damaged over time because of certain conditions you happen to have 
And the main ones are high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, cigarette smoking, bad, bad. And, um, well, getting older is uh, a all problem all to itself. But the four that you can watch out for, cigarette smoking, don't smoke. The thing that's the most that people don't seem to understand about the other risk factors, when we say risk factors, these are conditions you have that over time start damaging your pipes, damaging your pipes, lead to blockages and narrowings, and then lead to a stroke. Okay? So it takes a long time to cause the problem, but the earlier you stop these problems, the longer you will live or the longer you'll go without a heart attack or stroke. So I like to say to people, check under your hood while you still feel good. And I say that because high blood pressure, diabetes, and high cholesterol do not cause symptoms at all. They are symptom free until end stage. They're symptom free. So you don't know you have a high blood pressure unless you get your blood pressure checked. You don't know you have diabetes unless you get the blood test. You don't know you have high cholesterol unless you get the blood test. And if you just live in denial and don't go to a doctor for years and years. Because you feel good. You feel good. So when I say check under your hood, I always um, uh, liken it to a car. You know, men who are, uh, we've already mentioned, are pretty good at denying, uh, always take care of their car better than they take care of themselves. Hmm. So I always ask them, well, you have a car, do you let it burn up before, or you check the oil first? You know, obviously they check the oil. The car's still running, but you check the oil, you check the air pressure, check the filters. The body's no different. It has wear and tear. You have to periodically check and make sure these things are not present. And if they are present, take a medicine, modify lifestyle, et cetera, to not let those risk factors cause damage to your pipes. How common a problem is stroke in the general population in Oklahoma and correspondingly in the United States? So in the United States, it is the fourth leading cause of death and, the, and a leading cause of long-term disability. Uh, every uh, four minutes somebody dies of a stroke. It affects about almost 800,000 people a year in the United States. Oklahoma, unfortunately, uh, is always in the top three to four states in the country in terms of deaths due to stroke. Uh, it's actually part of what we would call the stroke belt. The stroke belt is mm. an area of the southeastern United States with a higher death rate due to stroke. Mm. Uh, it used to not be, you know, back when I started uh, practicing in the early 90s, uh, Oklahoma was not in the stroke belt, but it had actually gotten worse and evolved. Why is that? It may be because of the increase in burden of diabetes and obesity and other things like that, but I'm not sure 100%. No one knows 100% why the stroke belt exists. There have been conflicting studies, but the Southeast has a higher death rate due to stroke, and Oklahoma is one of the worst. All right. David Lee Gordon is our guest today on The Verdict. We'll be right back with more. When you have something important to communicate, it becomes clear that there's a lot of competition for your audience's attention. So how can your message stand out and actually resonate with your audience? Legal Graphics has the answers. The team at Legal Graphics will work with you to plan, design, and even test your presentation to ensure your message will be heard and remembered. Call Legal Graphics today to schedule an appointment. The readiness is all. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. I've got the power. I've got the power. We've got the power. And you've got the power too. You can donate to local arts and cultural projects that are in need of funding. You decide where your dollars go in your community. You have the power to bring projects to life. Search, donate, empower. Let your voice be heard. PowerToGive.org.
We are visiting with Dr. David Lee Gordon with the OU Health Science Center. I wanted to talk to you about cholesterol levels because mm -hmm. it seems to me, the, I remember the first time I ever had my cholesterol checked, I was in my 20s mm -hmm. and it was high due to you know, poor diet and probably some other factors. And they were saying, you know, you needed to get it below 200. And it seems like now when I go to my doctor, it, it, it's below 200, but they kind of want it lower and lower. And I'm thinking, it, it, have we changed our diagnosis and, and our goal yeah. for, for cholesterol levels yeah. through the years? The, the cholesterol recommendations have changed tremendously over the years. So what you're talking about is back in the 90s and earlier, we were looking at total cholesterol. And we thought that because of studies showing that high total cholesterol over 200 would be increased risk of stroke and heart attack, keep the total less than 200. Well, subsequently, they found out there are good cholesterols and bad cholesterols. Uh, what I like to call them lousy and healthy because yeah. they're, they are actually LDL and HDL, and the LDL is lousy and the HDL is healthy. So that's why I remember which is the good and the bad. But you really want the lousy, the LDL, to be low, and you actually want the HDL to be high. So when you look at total, it doesn't make sense to follow total because you've got a mixture of the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. So the new recommendations came along, uh, and they keep lowering them a little bit based on different studies. But a few years ago, the recommendations were for a normal human being to have the LDL, the lousy cholesterol, less than 100. And once you've had a stroke or heart attack or have diabetes, less than 70. Now, I have to tell you those recommendations have changed again. And the way they've changed is that they're telling doctors not to worry so much about the level, but really just worry about giving the right medicine. So let me explain. There are these things called statins. Mm -hmm. Statins are cholesterol medicines. Uh, the most common ones are... Lipitor, or Crestor, or there's Pravacol, or there's Simvastatin, et cetera. And these statins have been shown in studies to decrease risk of stroke and heart attack while also lowering the LDL. The problem is that when doctors focused on the LDL only, when people couldn't take statins or didn't want to take a statin, they would prescribe other medicines like niacin and things like this. And it turns out those things actually don't work. Even if they lower the LDL, they don't decrease your risk of stroke and heart attack. And why is that? Well, that's probably because it's more complex than we think. It's okay. probably not the cholesterol directly being the issue, but it's probably that whatever statins are doing, it's helping, while, by the way, lowering the LDL. So it's, this, we, there are a lot of issues like that. For mm -hmm. example, certain blood pressure medicines may be better for you than other ones, even if they lower the blood pressure the same amount. It's more complex than, than just it's lowering the LDL. So nowadays they're telling everybody to don't worry about, just make sure you focus on the statin. I still follow the levels to a degree, and that's okay as long as you're using a statin and not using some other, you know, drug that has not been shown to actually decrease strokes and heart attacks. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, uh, byproducts of some of these drugs? Are, are there risk factors with, with taking these cholesterol-fighting drugs? Well, statins, as you know, the biggest issue is it can cause muscle aches, can cause um, joint aches and those kinds of things, tendon problems. Um, everybody's different, uh, and so and every drug, each one of those drugs affects each individual differently. So, uh, and, and it also can be dose dependent as well. So, you know, every patient who has high cholesterol, I think should be on a statin. If you can't tolerate a certain statin, try another statin. There are four statins that have been shown to prevent stroke and heart attack and you can take a little holiday from one and try another one. You know, I myself am on my fourth, honestly, because of joint pains, but this one doesn't cause any problems. And I'd rather be on something and keep trying than to say, I can't take statins. So, it is a mistake to throw all the statins out just because one didn't work right for you. Other than the personal uh, discomfort, is it a mistake to stay with the statin that you uh, fear may be causing joint pain? Does that create something different that's no, I worrisome? Think that, no, I mean, you know, statins also can affect your liver, so you should have your liver tested right. once in a while, but, and make sure it's interfere with other medicine. However, if you can tolerate a statin, you should take a statin. Right. That's the bottom line. It really has decreased it actually shows it can decrease plaque and gunk in the arteries. I mean, it does its job. Statins do their job. Let me ask you something about uh, our viewers uh, may say, well, gosh, I don't smoke. I should be in good shape. Uh, my weight's under control reasonably. Uh, I'm probably not a very likely candidate uh, for a stroke. What effect, if any, does uh, lack of sleep and stress levels have on that, notwithstanding that they're not an, that they're a non-smoker and right and and the like. Well, first of all, I want to say that you can be thin and have high cholesterol, okay, and, or high blood pressure. Those things are often genetic and not related to even what your diet is. So that's first of all. But there are a whole set of I call them risk factors for the risk factors, things that will make your cholesterol be high or your blood pressure get high or other things, and will eventually cause trouble. So things like obesity things like physical inactivity, 
things like drinking too much alcohol. Uh, honestly, a little alcohol, one ounce a day for women and two ounces a day for men actually is not bad and good for you, but once you get above those levels, it actually greatly increases your risk. Um, lack of sleep and sleep apnea, which is very common in this state because sleep apnea is more common if you're overweight. Uh, what happens is you have extra weight on your throat and, you, and it blocks your breathing passage and that's why you snore, associated with snoring and weight gain and high blood pressure. It causes low oxygen at night and increases the damage to your pipes and high blood pressure, et cetera. And lack of sleep has been associated with those same things, high blood pressure and uh, increased risk of stroke. So generally speaking, you'd prefer seven hours of sleep, most people, but at least six, at least six and preferably seven for most people, although every individual is a little different about what their actual sleep needs are. So what about stress levels? Stress levels per se don't increase stroke risk so much. Um, unless they're tied to high blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, and it's a little different from heart disease. So heart attacks, for example, can occur during stressful times or during exercise because your heart is, has to pump against the high blood pressure, whereas the brain is not like that. It's actually getting blood supply at the end zone. So it doesn't have as bad a reaction to stress or exercise. Mm -hmm. Well, we've talked about how to prevent a stroke. Let's say um, you've had a stroke. Is there a way to lessen the chance of having another one or is there a way to get some of the uh, the faculties back that you may have lost because of a stroke? Absolutely. So first of all, as we said before, call 911, get to the hospital, get this blood clot breaker medicine, Drano, open up that clot, try to reverse the blockage. Once you're in the hospital, what we would do is then do a series of tests to find out where the clot came from. That's the bottom line. So this blood clot could come from a heart chamber, it can come from a, a, a bumpy pipe okay, in the uh, artery, uh, either one, or it can come from abnormal blood. Young people, sometimes those are actually normal, and they actually have a genetic defect or some problem with the blood being too sticky. Kind of the opposite of hemophilia, okay, where they have, mm. instead of bleeding too much, they would clot too much. I think that's why, you know, this Michael Johns who recently died, mm -hmm. uh, you heard about him, American Idol guy, who had a clot in his ankle, he probably had a, what we call a blood sticky state or hypercoagulable state, where his blood clotted too much, and that clot went from his ankle to his lungs and killed him. Uh, but that can actually go to the brain sometimes and cause strokes. So once you go to the hospital, we do these series of tests. And a normal, regular, older guy, we'd say, okay, we're worrying mainly about the heart and the pipes. So we do ultrasound tests or angiograms looking at arteries. We do MRI of the brain looking at our, the brain and arteries. We do heart tests, special echocardiograms, and see where the clot came from. This will determine what we do next because blood sticks for two reasons. Velcro and Jello. You got Velcro and Jello in your blood. Now, if you know that, mm -hmm. and there's little Velcro floating around your blood. They're called platelets, actually, but they act like Velcro. And if you have bumpy pipes, they'll stick to them. And so, how do you treat that? Well, you use anti-Velcro medicine, aspirin. Aspirin. That's how aspirin works. It doesn't let these little Velcro platelets stick to the pipes. Mm -hmm. So, if we determine that your bumpy pipes are the problem, you're getting aspirin or its cousin, clopidogrel or Plavix. On the other hand, let's say you have a heart problem. Well, this is what happens: blood clots for a different reason. That's called Jello clotting factors. So what you have, you guys made Jello before. You ever seen Jello being sure. made? Sure. Yeah. Put powder in the water and stir. Yeah. Stir, stir, stir. As long as you're stirring, you never make Jello. <laughs> you put it on the counter, you get Jello clumps. Right. So that's what happens in the body. The heart's pumping, boom, 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 boom. Normally, no problem. Let's say the quivering of a chamber. Now clot forms. Clot forms goes in the big chamber, pumps the brain. You have a stroke. That needs a different blood thinner. That needs an anti-Jello blood thinner. That's warfarin or mm -hmm. coumadin or these new medicines, Zarelto, uh, you know, Pradaxa, these new guys. Anticoagulants, not antiplatelets. So we pick the medicine based on that. And if there's a narrowing, we might actually open it up with a surgery or other procedure too. And I'm sure the research continues. We, Absolutely. we have run out of time, Dr. Gordon, but thank you so much it's for coming on and educating yeah, thank you myself very much. and my pleasure. as well as our, our viewers. We'll have a final word right after this. The human body, an amazing machine. What we're capable of is astonishing. If we look to what makes us human, we find that life is more than a heartbeat and hope is more than an idea. That knowledge moves us forward and our community keeps us together. OU Medicine is at its heart, keeping Oklahoma alive and well. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. 
For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. We have uh, uh, children coming from a different lifestyle, different mindset. You have to open your arms and really do what you have to do to have that child become a part of your family. And if it's more patience, that's what you do. Kids got to know they can trust you. And that's what we try to do with these kids. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. And for almost 30 years, Oklahoma political, government, and business leaders have turned to the McCarville Report for accurate, reliable, inside information. Visit the McCarville Report online. We've been visiting with Dr. Gordon with the OU Health Science Center on stroke. You know, to me, this show was a reminder of just what excellent doctors we have and how a lot of the cutting edge research is, is done in Oklahoma and our doctors are staying up with it. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, OU Medicine uh, that uh, lured uh, uh, Dr. Here uh, were looking for a, a captain. They, they wanted mm -hmm. a captain of their neurology department. They went out and recruited him, brought him here. And Dr. Gordon's been doing a fine, fine job ever since he's been here for now going on eight years. You can get more information about the OU Health Science Center on their website, OUHSC.edu. And we have a website. We'd love for you to go to our website and tell us about a guest you'd like to see appear on The Verdict or subject matter that you'd like to see us discuss. Our website is TheVerdict.tv. That's TheVerdict.tv. That's going to do it for this week's show. So glad you chose to join us. For Kent, I'm Mick, and we'll see you next week right here on The Verdict.